Hello and welcome back. I'm Steve Murphy, a trust and estates attorney with McGuire Woods LLP. And this is Legacy Planning Once Removed, my podcast on estate planning, trusts, property, taxes, family legacy, and everything else on my mind. In the news recently is Aretha Franklin. She died in 2018, and recently in 2023, a jury in Detroit, Michigan, decided a contest over her will. I have to say that Aretha Franklin had just such an incredible career, and it's actually been really fun looking back at her career. Um, she had some really great hits, and her personal story is also really inspiring. But upon her death, her estate was valued at about $80 million at the time, and there was a contest over her last will and testament. I have to say that it's not all that surprising that there was a contest or some uncertainty over her will and her estate. And that's just because she was a celebrity. We find that plenty of celebrities die with no will or with a will that causes some kind of dispute. One example, in 2016, the singer Prince died with no will. And it's not clear why celebrities or the rich and famous sometimes pass away with no will, no formal estate plan. Maybe it's because they're so focused on their craft that they don't manage their own affairs. It's like that old saying about the cobbler who goes barefoot, or maybe the cobbler whose children go barefoot. The cobbler is so focused on his craft that he's not uh, focused on providing for his family or even himself. Or maybe it's just because lots of people die this way without a will or without a formal estate plan, but we just notice it more with celebrities or with the rich and famous. This is sometimes called the spotlighting effect where certain people in the public eye, uh, it's just more noticeable. But in Aretha Franklin's case, she actually did have a will, but it's the kind of will or wills that she had, which are so interesting. After Franklin, two documents were found in her home. Her niece looked in the home for records. She scoured it and she found these two handwritten documents. An attorney who represented Aretha Franklin in other matters had reminded Franklin again and again that she should update her estate plan, that she should have a will. But he thought that she never actually went to an attorney to get a formal estate plan because of her desire for privacy, that she didn't want to share her personal affairs. So there were these two documents found in her home. By the way, both are handwritten and her signature is on each document and her signature is really remarkable. You can look it up online. Her last name is legible and cursive, but her first name is a kind of script, which actually actually looks like a smiling face. But if you look at other examples of her signature online, you'll see that it's a stylized version of her first name that, again, is drawn to look like a smiley face. So one of these documents was found in a locked cabinet. This was dated June 2010. Another was in a notebook dated 2014. And that document was stuffed under the cushions of her couch. Now, there are some differences between these two documents. One difference is that under the 2014 will, two of her children receive Franklin's main home in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, which was valued at about $1.1 million at the time. Another difference is that under the 2010 will, two of her children, quote, must take business classes and get a certificate or degree in order to benefit from her estate. So there are these key differences between the two documents. And after her death, there was a contest of which document was her true last will and testament. And it came down to the question of whether she intended the 2014 will to actually be her last will and testament. And that's what that jury in Detroit recently found was that she did intend that to be her last will and testament, so that's the will that governed. But there's a lot going on with the content of these documents. Note that Franklin was also concerned about giving her children too much. In the 2010 will, she wanted to make sure that two of her children took business classes before they could inherit. This is the kind of incentive clause that I often discuss with my clients and my students and in presentations, and that's gonna be a, another uh, podcast episode. But here, the lesson actually isn't of what the content of her will was. And the lesson actually isn't that you need a will. As I explained in episode two, everyone actually has an estate plan already. It's just a question of whether that plan includes a will. 
but rather the lesson is that you need to make sure you know where your will is. So now back to the title of this episode. I love catchy titles. This title is based on the old public service announcement. It's eight o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Or it's five o'clock. Do you know where your children are? But we can apply that here to our situation. You should know the answer to this question. You should know the answer right now. Where is the original of your will? The original is the one that really matters. In many states, including Virginia and Florida, if the testator has the will in his or her own possession at death, and if you can't find the original will after death, then there's a presumption that the testator actually revoked it, that they tore it up with the intent to not have that will apply. And there have been lots of cases on this issue with very bad facts where it seems like some bad actor might have gone in and stolen the original will. And that leads to the very least tension, dispute, and litigation. So where do you keep that all important original will? Well, historically, many people would often keep it at the attorney's office, but this isn't foolproof. I've seen examples where the attorney's building is destroyed by disaster or flood and law firms wind up and do go out of business. But lawyers often don't want to keep those originals. When I give talks to lawyers and other professionals on this topic, I go through all the reasons why a law firm should not be the one keeping the original will. But that's, again, maybe another topic, another episode. But from the client's perspective, there's a particular reason why it's not a good idea to keep your original with the attorney or the law firm. I worry that if the attorney has the original, then it might lead to a sense of a kind of captive client where there's a perception that the client has to work with this attorney. I don't want anyone to feel captive. To the contrary, I want my clients and their family to have agency. If they want to hire advisors, such as a law firm, such as me, I'm happy to help. But I don't want them to feel, directly or indirectly, forced to work with me. So my vote is for the client, for you, to keep it in a very safe place, a safe deposit box or a fireproof safe for popular options. But then my vote also is to tell someone where that original is. Of course, that sets up a difficult scenario because in the case of a will, there might be a bad actor out there who wants to know where the will is so they can destroy it at the, op at the uh, opportune time. Well, a good option would be to keep a good relationship with certain advisors and tell those advisors. Maybe it's your CPA. Maybe it's your financial advisor. Maybe it's your attorney. You tell them where that original is because that's the important thing to get on the trail, that someone knows where the original is. And then you can tell family members and friends that you work with that advisor, that they should contact that advisor in the event of your death. So here at Once Removed, we like to close with a takeaway. So again, the purpose of this episode is not to say that you should have a will. But while we're on the subject, this is a good reason to use a revocable living trust, because in that case, the original is not nearly as important. But what's the takeaway here? Well, in episode two, I suggested that you have a chart of your assets. Well, let's add another column or another couple of rows. How about a chart of your estate planning documents? That could have a list of which documents you signed, a will, a revocable trust, advanced medical directive, power of attorney, and when you signed them. Now, many people are worried about sharing the content of their estate planning documents with friends or family. And I think they're rightly concerned about that. That's the same sort of concerns that Franklin had about privacy. But keep in mind the goal here, to make sure people know where those documents are and know that the documents are in place. You don't need to share the actual content with anyone in order to share that information. You could just share maybe the contact that I, was, I mentioned before, or you could even share the dates and maybe the location. I'm Steve Murphy, and this has been Legacy Planning Once Removed, my podcast on thoughtful estate planning. Thanks for listening.